got a church Bible that looks like this. It's page 1194. Uh, we're at Colossians 3. Does anybody need a Bible that doesn't have one? Throw your hand in the air and I will gently throw this at you. So, Colossians 3, verses 1 to 15. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Amen. Tim. Can I pray for you? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the giftings you've given Tim. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would fill Tim up now. Help him to, to unpick what's already come out this morning, Lord, and as it goes into his talk. Father, I pray you would give us ears to hear. And then if there is anything you really want to land, Lord, that it would just jump into our brains, as Tim says it. May we do all this for your glory, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Good to see you all. Right, so we're in Colossians 3, and um, if it's on your device or in a Bible, do have that open and uh, in front of you, because uh, I'd like to take you through it so you can follow this and see this is principles coming from... Paul, who wrote this letter from the Bible, uh, rather than from myself. Um, so follow that with me. It's Colossians 3, 1 to 15. How do we live our best lives? The Bible claims that whatever captivates us will shape our lives and our destiny. Now, I wonder if you know the Narnia stories. I wonder if the lion and the witch and the wardrobe is familiar to you. Because in that story, a little girl called Lucy Pevens discovers a wardrobe, and she walks through the wardrobe, and the wardrobe goes on and on, further than it should, until, well, she can't find the back. And then she steps on snow, and she's discovered a whole new world, Narnia. And from that moment, Lucy is captivated by that new world, and as her encounters with Narnia continue, her motivations begin to change. And by the end of the story, she has a new outfit, which represents her new status. Well, as we read the letter from Paul, as we plunge into chapter 3, this letter written by a, a first century church planter to a new bunch of Christians in a town called Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey, we see that similar themes begin to emerge because Paul touches on these two worlds that seem to exist. He talks of two motivations, 
and he talks of two different outfits. So we'll have a look at, this, as, at that as we go through. Two worlds, two motivations, and two outfits. And Paul writes to the Colossians, desiring that they would make the most of their lives. And had he known the Narnia stories, perhaps he would have encouraged them to live like Lucy for Vence. And so the question this morning is this, how do we make the most of our lives? And why will living like Lucy help us? Well, let's start with two worlds. From the moment that Lucy goes through the wardrobe, there's no looking back. Her heart and mind become captivated by Narnia and its king, Aslan, the lion. Even when Lucy returns to England, her thoughts and her desires are with Narnia and with Aslan. She's captivated by Narnia. And her character and her way of living is shaped by her thoughts of Narnia. But not so for Lucy's older sister, Susan. Initially, she was just as excited as Lucy by Narnia and Aslan, but as she grew up, as she grew older, her memory of Narnia began to fade until she believed it had just been a childhood game, a figment of their creative imaginations. For the Colossians, the good news of Jesus Christ had opened up a whole new world. But they began to wobble. And Paul was worried that, like Susan, their memory would begin to fade. And so he wrote these words to us that we focused on last week in the old age service. Verse 1a, uh, the start of verse 1 to, to 2, verse 1 to 2. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So like Susan, the Colossians are in danger of forgetting and missing out on the most important treasures that are available to humanity. And I wonder if you and I are in danger of missing out on the most important treasures that are available to us. Did you know that everyone on this planet is a worshipper? Whether Christian or Jew or Hindu or agnostic or atheist, we're all worshippers. And that's because it's impossible for our hearts and minds not to be captivated by something that shapes who we are. There's always something or someone or whatever it may be that we derive our identity from, our sense of purpose from, our sense of security from. And Paul doesn't mince his words when it comes to that. He says in verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Idolatry is the key word in that verse, the key word in this passage, perhaps. Because Paul is fully aware that if our hearts and minds are not captivated by God and his ways, then there's only one alternative. They're captivated by something else, and that is idolatry. In other words, they're captivated by an imposter. They're captivated by something of an earthly nature that brilliant though it might be in itself, when it's made an ultimate thing, when it's made a God thing, it takes the place of God himself, the one who made it. And that's the heart of the problem that Paul is addressing in this passage. So an idol generally starts out being a good thing, a good gift from God, something nice. But when we make it an ultimate thing, when it becomes a God in our lives, a God thing, well, though it may promise much, we'll discover it delivers little. Now, the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. It's great news because it promises and delivers everything that our hearts and our minds yearn for. We might not know that we're doing it, but many of us will rely on something, maybe a relationship, maybe our job, maybe a hobby, maybe something else to deliver the status that we yearn for or the control or the comfort that we crave. For us, we make these things ultimate things. So the question for you is, what good thing 
are you most likely to turn into an ultimate thing? What would you not cope without? What would make you really mad if something or someone got in the way of it? I'll give you two examples from my life just to help you think of what it might be for you. So about 10 years ago, I was being made redundant. And I got really nervous having failed to land a job after interview after interview after interview. I had a mortgage to think of, I had a family to think of, and I started to sweat quite a bit. I think my security was certainly in having a steady income. And for the first time in my adult life, there was that threat that I wouldn't have a steady income. And I started to lose a bit of perspective. And I'm ashamed to say that when under pressure, when a particular interview came up, I kind of warned someone else away from it who was thinking of going for it too. Now, thankfully, I was rubbish at being intimidating or warning someone away from it because when I apologized to him later, he hadn't even noticed. But in my mind, I knew something was going on that wasn't quite right. The words just came out and I thought, oh, that's not what I mean. But something was going on where this need for security from this steady income was shaping the way I was behaving. I'll give you a second example. Well, first of all, so Paul knows that idolatry of any kind does shape and bring out the ugly sides of our character. And that's why he says in verse 8 these words, rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger. We'll pause there for a moment. He's talking about unreasonable anger, not righteous anger. It's right when we're angry about certain things. It's right that we're angry, perhaps, that Putin started a war in Ukraine. But there's a, that's a kind of a righteous anger. But there's an unreasonable level of anger that is not right, that ugly side of our character that comes out when things get in the way of us and the thing that we crave. So rid yourselves of such things as, as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language, or perhaps more accurately, abusive language, language that puts others down in order to raise ourselves up. It's shameful what we do, isn't it? When someone or something threatens to get in the way of the thing that we crave, me included. So I'll give you a second example from my life, just again to help you think, what is it for you? An easy one for me to think of is sport. Sport could so easily be an idol in my life, and I think at times it is. I have to keep a close eye on it. Sport's a great gift from God, I love it, but I also know that when I'm playing sport and I'm fit and I'm feeling strong, I'm feeling at my best, somehow I derive a sense of identity from that. I feel more confident, I feel more important even, and when I'm unfit and when I'm injured, I feel less confident, I feel like a lesser version of myself. But that's not quite right if that's where my identity is coming from. So I do know I've got to keep a careful eye on that. I know it's going wrong when I'm overly disappointed or overly frustrated if something gets in the way of being able to train or play. All false gods promise a sense of freedom, but ultimately they fail to deliver. In the very least, they deceive and then disappoint. And many of us can find ourselves actually enslaved by these things that at first promised freedom. And the irony for the Colossians is they'd only just discovered that through Jesus Christ they have this whole new world of freedom. And then they were reverting back to their old ways and finding themselves enslaved again. The good news of Jesus is he promises freedom and he delivers freedom. He's the only one who can fulfill all that our hearts yearn for. Which is why Paul writes in verse 11, Christ is all and is in all. Christ is all. Christ can be our everything. Christ is all and is in all. So what are your idols? What good things do you turn into ultimate things or God things? Christ is all. He can be your everything. The question is, will we let him? Will we set our hearts and minds on things above, like Lucy, where Christ is seated rather than on earthly things? Or, or what else will captivate our hearts and our minds? 
Because whatever captivates us will shape our lives and will shape our destinies. So two worlds, which one will we focus on? But Paul also writes of two motivations. Paul gives us two motivations here to help us think through this very carefully. A kind of a carrot and a stick approach, if you like. One's definitely um, much easier to read than the other. The first one, the easier one, the carrot, is the new creation. And the second one, the harder one to swallow, is God's judgment. So let's start with the easy one, the new creation. In verse 4, Paul wrote, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And this really captures my attention, because Like Lucy, I've discovered that this life isn't it. This isn't everything. There's more than just this. And one day, we'll be with Christ in the new creation for eternity. I'll have the whole of eternity to explore this perfect world that's been made right. All the good things about this world and nothing else. No more pain, no more war, no more worry. A perfect creation. Everything restored and made right again. So that really takes the heat out of my current troubles. If I lose my job, for example, I know that this isn't it. And it won't last forever. It gives me a sense of proportion. Relatively speaking, it won't last long. If I get injured, I know this isn't it. And it won't last forever. And in the new creation, I'll never have to face injury again. I always have to remind myself, though, that I'm living for much more than my status in this world. I can live from my status that comes from him. But I have to look up and remind myself not just to look down. So the new creation, for me, that's a really compelling motivation that drives me on. But there's a second one, and it's God's judgment. Paul lists things that idolatry gets us into. Greed, lust, evil desires, impurity, sexual immorality. And then he says in verse 6, because of these, God's wrath is coming. Because of these, God's anger, God's judgment is coming. So according to the Bible, according to Paul, who wrote this letter, to take God's gifts and turn them into God things is really to slap God in the face himself. It's as if we're saying, God, we want all your stuff, but we don't want you. We want all your stuff, thanks very much, we'll worship that. And he's thinking, but I made it. It's like, but I don't want, don't want to know you. And like any kingdom, if a rebel slaps his king in the face, he'll face judgment. And it's no different with the king of all kings. If we live our lives as if we're slapping God in the face, the Bible says we'll live under judgment. God's wrath is coming. The Bible describes God as compassionate, kind, humble, generous, and patient. But one day his patience with us will run out. And the Bible explains that if we make the decision now to live without God, then we'll continue in eternity without God. And we'll continue in a place that lacks compassion and kindness and humility and generosity, and patience. That's quite a dark place. And I'm not underlining that to upset anyone, but simply to point out what Paul is saying here and what is consistent with the whole of the Bible, this carrot and stick approach, that the gospel is great news because it frees us from false idols and we look forward to a perfect and new creation. But to avoid or reject that, means we're stuck with the consequences of idol worship. And Paul says, idols will ultimately let us down. Now I'm glad some of the children arrived at this point because this is where we move on. Two worlds, two motivations, and now two outfits. For Christmas, my brother bought me a new outfit. It's in this bag. Anyone know what this is? 
What outfit do you think we have here, children? A it's a sleeping outfit of sorts. What else? A giraffe. It's a giraffe onesie. Yeah, it's got a giraffe face and everything. Look at that. And a tail somewhere. It's got a tail. Yeah. I don't know what was in my brother's mind when he bought this. Like, why, does, why did he think of a giraffe of all animals? I have no idea. <laughs> anyway, I, won't put it, I might put it on. I'm quite cold. <laughs> so this giraffe onesie was bought for me, and I thought when I opened this, when on earth am I going to get the opportunity to wear this? I wasn't thinking of church, that's for sure. But why not? I can't quite get it on without putting my legs in it, but that's going to be too much effort for today. But my arms are getting cold, so I'm going to at least try and get those in. Oh, how about that? All right, that'll do. That'll do. Yeah, that'll do. Good enough. Good enough. Oh, hood up. Hood up. I have got a rather cold head as well. There we go. How's that? Even better? Okay, now I'm giraffe. Now I'm giraffe. Now, the, the reason I'm wearing a giraffe one's in church this morning, I thought I'm really going to get, really going to get the opportunity to wear this. But I've just come back from a children's residential this weekend, and I got to wear it quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, a police detective themed weekend. And I wore a police helmet, and I was Constable G. Raff. And the children had to find me. Mm -hmm. Quite a good game. So I actually quite like dressing up. And, uh, and I think Paul is into dressing up a little bit too. Because in his letter to the Colossians that we've been reading this morning, Paul talks about two different kinds of outfits. But the outfits that he suggests are way more ridiculous and more shocking than this one. Even more ridiculous than the giraffe outfit. He says in verse 9, if you're following, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and in the image of its creator. I'm going to take the hood off, just for a moment. <laughs> so the old self, the old outfit, that's really our, our ugly, more embarrassing, more shameful characteristics. The deeds, the thoughts, the words that come out of us that we're not very proud of. And the new self, Paul says, is the image of our creator. That would be a strange outfit to put on. Our creator being God. Can you imagine dressing up as God? What would that involve? What would you even get hold of to put on? What would you wear? What comes to mind when you think of dressing up like God? Paul helps us out. All yellow with a blanket on your head. That's what we could look like. Very big. Very big. Yeah, might have to get bigger. Paul, Paul uses these words. Stand on the stool. Stand on the stool to get bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This could go on a while. Yeah. Yeah. Could go on a giant log. Or on the top of a giant's head. Amazing. I'm going to tell you the words that Paul uses to help us out here. He says, therefore, verse 12, as God's chosen people, holy, that means set to live differently, and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. He's essentially saying clothe yourselves like God, but he says these words. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Can you see why that is a ridiculous and shocking outfit? On what planet could I and God be described as being equally compassionate and kind and humble and generous and patient? My printer only has to run out of ink and paper and you will see I'm not very patient. And my anger will come out. No one would fall for that disguise if I dressed up like God. But, and this is where it gets even more shocking. God was stripped of his clothes. Did you know that? God was stripped of his clothes and put naked on a cross. We often picture him a bit more dignified with something around his middle. But he was stripped naked and put on a cross. And that nakedness was part of his humiliation and shame that he bore for us. God was stripped naked so he could take our shame for all the the bad things that we've done and thought and said so that we could be treated as if we were him. He was treated as if he were us. So we don't have to be humiliated 
for the shameful things that we've done. Instead, he gives us a new set of clothes. He dresses us in the clothes of Jesus. He looks at us as if we were as pure as Jesus, as if we were as compassionate and kind and humble and gentle and patient as Jesus, as if we've never done or thought or said anything wrong at all. And he treats us like that. And that is the only status, the only identity that matters. And with his help, we can start being more like Jesus. We can start being kinder, more compassionate, more kind, more gentle, more patient. Because Christ is all and Christ is in all. So if Paul were writing to us today, I'm sure he'd be asking the question, will you live a little bit more like Lucy? There are two worlds. Will we allow Jesus and his ways to captivate our hearts and our minds? He offers us two motives. Will we allow our eternal futures to motivate us in how we live today and tomorrow? And he offers us two outfits. Will we allow our status in Christ to shape how we think and talk and act? To live the best lives, will we live a little more like Lucy? Amen.